So on to tonight, um, I'm very pleased to welcome my, my colleague, Gillian Crawford. Um, just a bit of background, Gillian comes from a scientific background in first in the food industry and then in education, various roles in education, and been interested in astrology since a very young age. She had been an Aquarius 7 committee member for Oh, we're getting on for four years now, I think. It was pre-COVID. And she's also on the tutoring team at the Kairos School of Astrology, which is uh, run by John Wadsworth. And she does astrological consultations and workshops and online courses. So tonight's talk is called The Charts of Trailblazing Women, as I'm sure you all know. So um, over to you, Julian. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, welcome to my talk this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to share a part of what I've learned um, during this period of exploration with you. I hope you enjoy what I have to offer as much as I have a process of discovery. And, and this really is for me the story of, of my search. There was a particular person, maybe a couple of people who really inspired this. And I'll come on to who they were in a minute. And the seeds for this presentation were sown perhaps two years ago or so. When I found out something about someone's chart, I thought, oh, goodness, wow. And I, I wonder. So it's a curiosity um, led talk. Um, I've always been a bit of a feminist and I'm interested in history and there will be a bit in the talk about the historical context in which these various women lived because it's possible I think to take for granted some of the things that um, we have as, as women today, um, some of the um, if privileges if your rights if you like that simply didn't exist a while ago. So I'm going to look briefly at some of those. I have a lot of charts. Um, this is definitely going to be an overview and a light touch. Uh, and I will be looking for patterns in the data. And some of my little hypotheses turned out to be wrong and some were quite surprising to me. And I thought, oh gosh, that's interesting. So I'll tell you a bit about how my views have shifted at the end. So who was the first inspiration for this? It was a woman called Anne Lister. And many of you may remember the BBC series Gentleman Jack, which starred Saran Jones. I was, um, I watched the programmes. I, I was somewhat taken by her energy and her entrepreneurship and how brave she was, frankly. And I thought, I wonder to what extent there's truth behind this. So I did a bit of digging and it turns out that she was indeed um, a diarist. She wrote in code. Um, because um, she really poured out her heart and soul into her diary and didn't want that necessarily read by anybody. And she was an adventurer, without a doubt. Um, very forthright, very business orientated, independent, and as you'll see when we look at her chart in a moment, um, quite sensuous. She, uh, I mean, the main the thing that was considered to be scandalous in those days was that she preferred to take female lovers and um, that was sort of not on anyone's radar in those days. But she was also a traveller, um, loved travelling and that is what she has in common with so many other people in this talk. This is what made me, oh my goodness, um, look at her chart, that airy stellium. So it's an untimed chart. So with an untimed chart, we obviously have no house overlay. And we have to be very careful about the position of the moon because um, for an untimed, uh, an unknown birth time, what we do is we go for noon. And then given that the moon can move maybe 14 degrees in a day, we need to remain aware that the moon can be plus or minus seven degrees of where it's shown in the noon chart, depending upon the actual time of birth of which we're ignorant. Even so, 
born very close to a new moon, even if the moon moves to and fro. And I was fascinated by that amount of energy, personal planet energy and Saturn as well, of course, and the South Node in Aries. And I was very interested in the fact that um, they largely seem to be making trines or Uranus is making trines to many of those personal planets. Oh, okay, interesting. I'll, I'll just, I did mention that she was a sensuous woman and here we have Venus in rulership in Taurus. So I thought, okay, I wonder. Um, it's, uh, this is just in there to show you how close some of those trines are. So you can see that Uranus is at 10 degrees of Leo making trines to these Aries planets and the closest ones are, are to Mars and to Saturn. So that was pretty much how I felt. Um, I wonder how much of a role Uranus plays in the charts of women who are perceived to be adventurous. To me, Uranus is the planet that has to do with our evolving integrity and being true to ourselves. And I think that for someone to, to go against what our the rules, if you like, and social roles of the society that they live in, um, maybe they need strong Uranus, but it's just a hypothesis at the moment. I was also interested in the fire element and how inspiring that might be. So next, I looked to another inspiration, Dervla Murphy. Um, I chose her, she was the second because I'd read Full Tilt years ago. This wonderful book about her travels from Ireland uh, across the sea initially, obviously, and then through Europe, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way to India, bicycling all the way to India. Oh, my goodness. So I thought I'd try and check out her chart. She's well known because she is a writer, uh, wrote more than 20 books, most of which were about travel, and she died relatively recently. So here is her untimed chart, and here we go. We've got this time, we've got a Sagittarius stellium of the personal planets, Mars, Mercury, Venus, and co-present um, the Sun also in Sagittarius. And I think that this is beautifully illustrated. We sometimes speak our charts. Beautifully illustrated, when she was asked if she had a particular reason for going traveling, this Sagittarian energy comes through, I think, in what she says. No, I just go to enjoy myself. And this lovely bit, I'm completely irresponsible, absolutely no commitment to anything. Um, and did she feel she had to justify her journey? No, not at all. So, <coughs> excuse me, so uh, that rather delighted me. Um, on the subject of Uranus, we appear to have, um, we've got... Well, this chart's untimed, I'll more about that in a minute, but we've got a grand trine apparently here between Uranus, Jupiter, and particularly Mars, I think, here. But let me move on because I actually managed to find out, I didn't, couldn't just start off with, but I found out her birth time, which is obviously very important. In the beginning of her autobiography, she speaks about her birth. And there's a story of the local doctor who delivered her going into the library because that was where her father worked to tell her father that um, his wife had given birth to a strong girl who came at quarter to 12. So I was delighted to get a house overlay here. We can be sure of the moon position and um, and some really interesting things begin to emerge. I mustn't go too long on this, but what really interested me is this, um, they're not precisely, uh, they're, they're not con conjunct, it is fairly wide, but they are co-present, Pluto and the Moon in Cancer. One of the interesting things about Derva Murphy's life is that she wasn't able, she did do a little tiny bit of traveling, but she wasn't able to go traveling for some considerable length of time because her mother was an invalid and she left school aged 14. That wasn't uncommon in those days, uh, leaving school aged 14. But effectively from then on, she nursed her mother and her mother died in August, 
1962, when Dervla was 30, obviously close to her Saturn return. And her father had died 18 months earlier. So after all those years of being a dutiful daughter, Dervla was free to do what she'd wanted to do since she first got her bicycle at the age of 10. Because we have the house overlay, we can see that the house of long distance travel, the ninth house, lies in Scorpio, which means that Mars, that Sagittarian Mars, rules the, the ninth house. Interestingly, it also rules uh, the, the 10th house because the 10th house cusp also lies there. But one of the things that interested me is, is, is the almost possibly suffocating sense of, of, of the, the mother here and the effect that it had on Derva's life. Okay, um, and we can be fairly sure, therefore, that as well as this grand trine uh, from Uranus, we've also got um, this, this T-square taking in the moon. So that got me thinking and reading and analysing and looking at however many charts I could possibly um, dig up. I wanted to find out something about what motivated women travellers. I wanted to know what clues about their lifestyle choices could be found in their birth charts. And the question of why they haven't been written out of history, because we don't always hear a great deal about the history of women. Um, so let's move on. I had some tentative theories. I thought it was interesting that we have these stelliums in fire aspects from Uranus, but I, I to the luminaries or personal planets, but I wanted to take it fairly gently. And um, I'm going to move on to some of the people going further back in time. And the person I'm going to go to now is Lady Elizabeth Craven. She was a lady in her own right, daughter of an Earl, married age 16, most unwillingly to the sixth Earl of Craven. And she had an extremely unhappy marriage. Uh, both of them had affairs, uh, absolutely scandalous for a wife to have affairs. Um, she bore him seven children during the 13 years that they were together. And then she decided she'd had enough and she left. And after that, she traveled, she set off 1785 to 86 for her first journey, which was with a lover, whom she did not include in her memoirs. And um, she traveled extensively after that in Europe and the Levant. So having a look at this chart, um, untimed again, we need to be careful of the moon. So although I would love to say there is a grand trine here in fire, we do need to be a bit cautious. That moon, um, which I've highlighted, um, can't be certain of it, uh, but intriguing nevertheless. Um, I'll come on to Grand Trines a bit later, um, but I love what Noel Tile says about Grand Trines, that it's um, a sort of closed circuit of, and for a fire Grand Trine, motivational self-sufficiency. And he also says this, in every way, the fire Grand Trine is a do your own thing stamp of self-approval and oh my goodness lady elizabeth craven needed that sort of fire in her belly to ignore what society expected of her she was decidedly scandalous she wrote a lot which is why we know something about her um plays memoirs one of the things she wrote was something called letters to her son and that was when she protested some of what she saw as the legal inequities of marriage. So we've got a couple of quotes from her. Matrimony is less calculated to make people happy than any other institution, human or divine. Clearly, she's speaking from experience there. There are many people that do have happy marriages, but hers was not one of them. And she speaks of the laws, which I'll go over in a second. Um, these laws are made by men and are a form of tyranny. And these are some of the things that she points out, that this all comes down to the idea that a wife is required to promise at the marriage service to obey her husband. A husband could legally give her no money, squander his money, squander his wife's money, beat his wife, as long as it was with a stick no bigger than a certain uh, thickness, 
He could lock her up and he could be unfaithful with prostitutes or mistresses, she said. Whereas a wife had no legal redress and if she sought divorce or separation, and let's remember that this is precisely what she did, she, she, she left the marriage, she would be disgraced and deprived of her own children. And, and frankly, she was spot on because the historical status of women um, has not particularly been very favorable to them. Um, there are very, very powerful norms and beliefs about what women should be like and what their roles are in society. The primary roles, and we'll see it again and again as we go through some more of these charts, are as loyal daughters, wives, mothers, housewives, that's it. Um, there was a widely held view that women uh, are less intelligent than men, their heads are smaller, so of course they must be. <laughs> Uh, certainly a view that women belonged to their fathers and husbands. Just think of the, the little echo that we have in the marriage service. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? The, the woman is given away like a piece of property. Um, and certainly it was believed that women should be quiet, not make their voices heard, and they should be obedient and helpful and supportive to their husbands. So an ideal woman was chaste, modest, and above all, quiet. Strong sexual double standards. It was absolutely fine for the sick Earl of Craven to have as many affairs as he pleased. It was not fine for his wife. And there were huge social constraints around a woman's reputation. In those days, a woman would need to go around with a chaperone, either an old woman of her own, uh, another woman, or uh, a male member of her family. And if she were to lose her honour and reputation by putting herself in um, a situation where her morals might become suspect, then um, the response could be, really alarming and all of this pretty much came in to the UK at any rate um, when the Normans invaded um, prior to that Anglo-Saxons there was a bit more equality not complete but between women and men but this was the start of English common law uh, the law of coverture or coverture coverage which treats married men and women as one financial entity but it puts on top the, the, the rights of the man. Married women have no financial rights to own property, to sue in court or to undertake certain uh, jobs. Although widows and spinsters could do. So looking at when they, these changed and women began to achieve some sort of financial equity with men, France was one of the early countries um, well, after the revolution, but um, 1881, single women could have a bank account of their own, and 1886, married women could open a bank account without the husband's position, permission. In the USA, this had to wait until, um, well, actually, no, in, in the USA, it had to wait until 1974, because in the 60s, banks required single women or divorced or widowed women, they had to bring a man along to co-sign a credit application, regardless of how well off the person was. And the UK slightly behind America. I was intrigued in my studies to find this out. I think it was honoured um, more in the, the breach than the observance. I don't think that many people uh, did do this, but English pubs had the legal right to refuse to serve a woman buying drinks right the way up to 1982. Really, really, not that long ago. I don't want to spend too long on women's suffrage, but you might like to have a think about when these dates happen. When did women get the right to vote on the same basis as men? Here we go, New Zealand, we're ahead of the game. Uh, the USA, um, 1920 uh, prohibited sexual discrimination, but all women, including coloured women, uh, uh, women of colour, sorry, um, could, they couldn't vote until uh, quite a lot later. Uh, the UK, it was 1928 when they were allowed to do so on the same basis as men, and the 1929 election was known as the flapper election because all these young women were suddenly allowed to vote. 
Switzerland was quite late, 1971 at a federal level, and actually not until 1991 in this canton could women vote in local elections, and then the federal uh, government decided to overrule it. So, okay, I, how did I choose my women? Well, I did quite a lot of research online, but I have to say I'm also very indebted to this particular book because it is brilliant. And if anyone get, wants to, <coughs> excuse me, get hold of a copy, I would thoroughly recommend it. It's a wonderful read, Mary Russell. The Blessings of a Good Thick Skirt. And that quotation is taken from the next person that I want to look at. And that person is a woman called Mary Kingsley who is definitely something of a heroine of mine now that I've found out more about her. So Mary, very dutiful daughter, sister. Her father was something of an anthropologist and travels. He was away for a lot of the time. When he came back, she was responsible for organizing her father's uh, papers and uh, translating sometimes. She, she was allowed to learn German so as to help her father with that. And it must have been very interesting for Mary to read about these adventurous exploits that her father had done. But she was basically looking after her mother. And it wasn't until around her Saturn return, when both parents had died, she wanted, she was able to set out for the west coast of Africa, which is what she wanted to do. She, she wanted to do some anthropological study of her own. Death and the Wesleyans, she was advised to get in touch as quickly as possible after her arrival, given that she couldn't be dissuaded, to get in touch with the Wesleyan missionaries there, on the grounds that they could help her if, uh, if she were to die, which was almost certain, um, that they would be able to give her a decent burial, which was very important. But uh, despite the risks, despite everybody trying to warn her against this, off she set to explore the west coast of Africa. Her mind was set on going and she had to go. This is where the quote that um, the book that I just shown you uh, gets, uh, where that comes from. So the situation is this. She's walking along with a few of her African guides. She used to dress like a proper Victorian lady all the time she was advised to wear perhaps the new knickerbockers, but no, no way was she doing that. She was a lady and she was going to wear a full skirt and uh, everything's buttoned up to the neck, long sleeves, bonnet, everything. And then she says how useful it was when she accidentally fell into a trap with 12 ebony spikes uh, on, on which she fell. And she said, it's at these moments that you realize the blessings of a good thick skirt. Say for a good many bruises, here was I, with the fullness of my skirt tucked under me, sitting on nine ebony spikes, some 12 inches long, in comparative comfort, howling lustily to be hauled out. And I think that speaks to her resilience and the way that she approached this. So she was very independent minded. She was an early anthropologist and, um, one of the things she noticed, she was very interested in African beliefs and actually listening to the natives. And um, she'd noted that the local missionaries were trying to get the local girls in Calabar to stop wearing a piece of cloth that they would wrap around their waists and allow to trail on the ground. And the reason that they were doing that is outside the home where they were not safe from wicked spirits, um, they needed to trail that onto the ground so as to protect them. And absolutely no respectable Calabar young woman would be seen without one of these trailing pieces of cloth. But um, the missionaries at the time had decided that um, it was just another example of African slovenly ways. And they tried very hard to stop the girls from doing it. And Mary commented that this was a war between native and Presbyterian respectability. She didn't really have an awful lot of time for the missionaries. And of course, missionary uh, work was one of the reasons that many spinsters went off to uh, various continents. I haven't actually included quite so many of them. I could have done, but um, I had to make some choices as to which ones to focus on. 
Um, and I suppose I've gone for those who drew me. Uh, anyway, she was very adventurous abroad, but she was very careful of her reputation. So much so that when she came home in order to raise money for her next second trip to Africa, um, she wrote talks, but she wouldn't give them. She had her talks read by a man while she sat in a little chair at the side. She was quiet and she wasn't much in favour of um, a, a feminism either. She was anti the whole idea of women's suffrage. So interesting woman. Um, but she was a contemporary of David Livingstone. And to give you an idea of the sort of shoestring travel that she she did, um, she, her second visit to Africa cost about £500, whereas David Livingstone uh, had raised 10,000, 20 times as much to support his own missionary work in Africa. So the next person I, I want to look at is, um, oh, I'm sorry, the astrology. Mustn't forget the astrology. Okay, well, here we have actually a Libran, um, and a quite a lot of energy in Libra. We've got Sun, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn's actually in, in Virgo. Um, we do have some interesting aspects from Uranus. In fact, the Uranus trying to the sun is very close indeed. If we look at this next slide, um, we've got uh, the sun at 90, nearly 20 degrees, and Uranus is 20 and a half. So it's incredibly close. Untimed chart, can't be sure of the conjunction with the moon, but if you allow quite a large orb, possibly, possibly. Marianne North, someone who traveled for a different reason altogether. Now, she um, is best known as a botanical artist, but not for the sort of watercolors that characterized most uh, artists who, who, who drew flora and uh, foreign flora, which is what she was interested in. She actually painted in oils. And she started painting when her mother died. And when her mother died, she did travel with her father for several years. She was quite devastated when her father died. But nevertheless, it did free her in a way. She determined that she was going to go carry on doing her paintings abroad. And that was when she was aged 39. And she traveled extensively in all sorts of countries, one visit after another after another to do these amazing paintings. She also wrote and she was responsible for a gallery at creating and she paid for it, a gallery at Kew Gardens. And actually, if you have the time, it's worth going onto the Kew Gardens website. There are some lovely videos showing uh, something about her life and her work. And I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor of this. She was so prolific. And you look at the vibrancy of these beautiful, beautiful paintings um, of, of flora, yes, but also of landscapes, quite unique. And the gallery that uh, bears her name has hundreds of these, one packed after another, packed really, really close. Um, I, I'm definitely inspired to go there one day. While she was planning this gallery of her own, um, she did suggest to the people at Kew that um, she wanted people to be comfortable and sh that they should be given perhaps a cup of tea and also some cake so that they feel welcome when they go into the gallery. Now, they didn't take her up on the idea of the cake, but that little note of the gracious hostess, I think is really sweet when you look at her her um, Venus and her Mercury in, in, in Libra, that the, speaks to me of the, the gracious hostess there. Um, she had no personal planets in fire, so my early hypotheses, not doing very well on that. <laughs> her sun is in Scorpio only just. The sun moves a degree a day, but at, not, but at um, 35 minutes into Scorpio, I think we could be reasonably clear that she is a Scorpio sun, relatively unusual amongst our travelers. And here we've got, well, we've got uh, Uranus making some aspects 
Uh, fairly wide aspects, though, to be honest. Uh, yeah, square, square to the sun, six degrees, pretty wide. Um, I, I put in the Grand Trine to Chiron. Some people might not um, wish to include Chiron in something like this, but um, there's a reason for this, and it comes back to something that we'll see a bit later on. Um, so she does appear, if you include Chiron, to have a Grand Trine in Earth. Okay, <clears throat> I did a lot of work. I did a lot of work on people who travelled in the 20th century as well. Dervla Murphy obviously was one. But in the end, I decided when it came to analysing the data, having some sort of cutoff point in time was going to be helpful because things eased for women at some stage during the 20th century, and it's difficult to know exactly when. And so I thought, okay, well, if I, if I simply cut off the birth times of people who were born after 1900, I've still got quite a lot to look at. And indeed I did. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the vast majority of these were on time charts. We've got one or two that are timed, but so the numbers here are nothing to do with houses. They were just my code for uh, which sign they were in. Um, so, what I wanted to do was to look at relatively small sample, 23, 23 in that sample. Uh, I thought it was 24, and then by the time I'd done all the work, I realized it was 23. Um, but if there had been 24 subjects and every planet was equally distributed, we'd expect two in each sign category and six in each element category. Obviously, uh, 23 is very close to that, but the sample size is small, so we need to be very careful because it's subject to variation by chance. But I was hoping that I would find some patterns. And when I look at the sun sign analysis, I was a little disappointed um, because, uh, yeah, marginally greater for some signs than others, but I don't really feel that I can say there's anything conclusive here about the sun signs of the people that I happened to choose and find out about. Every single sun sign is represented. That was a bit of an oh moment. Um, but you have to go with, with the data. I've mentioned issues with untimed charts. So when it came to moon signs, I wanted to be really clear as to whether the moon was definitely in a given sign or not. And uh, for some, if, if it was a good seven degrees away from the edges of the sign, and I was confident that gave me a number of 15 out of the 23. Uh, some of these I, I thought probably not uh, Marianne North, bless her, too, too, close to, um, too close to the edge of the sign. Isabella Bird Bishop probably, I mean six degrees and 50 minutes of Libra, but you never know. So let's look at the data for moons. If you take the entire sample, um, there is a significant number of airy moons. Um, I, I think that number is significant compared with the um, number of six that we might expect if it was all equal. And of course, the air sign is associated with curiosity and communication, with interaction, with business, with relationships. And you would expect our travellers to be able to get on with people and to negotiate what they needed to be able to move forwards. Uh, but a bit concerned, I did want to have a look at the definite moons and actually that high incidence there is primarily explained by uh, the, the ones for whom the moon is certain um, and that, that's pretty high there. So maybe there's something about airy moons, looking at personal planets, very little that one can say about the placement of Venus, Mercury, a higher than usual chance for uh, Mercury is to be in air signs and let's not forget that we know about these people because they wrote and they communicated and um, a higher than average uh, for, for Mars, Mars in fire signs. So okay, interesting, still a lot of variability though. I looked at Jupiter and Saturn as well, nothing specific on Jupiter, 
<laughs> Saturn more likely to be in fire signs, but uh, I think we need to take it lightly. And I didn't tally the outer planet placements because that was really caused by my choice, by my decision to just cut off at the end of uh, of, of 1899 and of course they move very slowly so I didn't look at those so my initial conclusions um there is an awful lot of variation in specific planetary placements for these people maybe there's a bit of skew towards air and fire but uh the biggest overall thing I, I also did a tally of um where how many planets from uh, sun included sun and moon how many uh, fell in signs that were ruled by a particular planet. I did double up the sun and the moon because they only, <laughs> they only um, rule two signs, uh, one each. But um, no, the biggest, um, there was a higher incident of Jupiter ruled, uh, planets and Jupiter ruled signs, but yeah, I'm gonna take it lightly. Basically what I took away from all of this, and some of you are going to be saying, well, yes, of course, it's the individual chart that matters. Of course it is. Um, we need to be a little bit careful about simple rules. And my original, oh my goodness, wow, am I onto something? No, I, I, I wasn't really. Um, so I think it's really important for us as astrologers to be very careful to avoid overgeneralizations and self-fulfilling prophecies. Pro prophecies. Um, you know, and, and not to say, well, of course, of course that's going to happen because planet X is in Aquarius or what have you. No, not necessarily. And of course, we also need to be careful because we don't have a house overlay and there's a limit to what we can say. So I had to conclude that um, what motivated my travellers, well, as I went more and more into their lives, um, there wasn't, there were a number of different reasons, but everyone was different. I am still quite interested about the role of Uranus and its aspects to the luminaries or personal planets and whether that supported our travellers to, to go ahead and do what it was they really wanted to do that they felt was part of their integrity as a person. Maybe there's some influence of fire, fire inspiration and curiosity of air. And I, I think that role of Mercury is interesting, a slight um, preponderance of airy Mercury's. Of course, they all wrote about their experiences. But, but one pattern, and <laughs> this is why I've mentioned this up to now, <coughs> excuse me, it's a relatively high incidence of grand trines, which I found surprising. Now, I could only fit eight onto a page, and there are others as well, and Blunt isn't on there. Uh, there are others who aren't on there. And in all fairness, there are also people who do not fit this. But I, I was sort of under the impression that grand trines and kites were relatively rare, um, relatively. Um, and there seems to be a remarkable preponderance of these in the charts of some of the women that I looked at. I have highlighted the moon in charts that aren't timed. And I'm glad to say that with the exception of Elizabeth Craven, I did actually say that, yeah, this grand trine might not be reliable because it includes the moon. Uh, most of these other grand trines exclude the moon. Um, so I, I, it's really, really quite interesting. I thought I'm going to look at this in a bit more detail. Uh, so, so here we go. Why might we get more grand trines than one might expect in the charts of audacious women travellers? Well, grand signs are characteristically associated with ease and good fortune. And of course, travel is usually limited to the well-off, the well-to-do. And certainly many of our early travellers were, were well-off. They had, excuse me, they had some money behind them. But I am also drawn to Noel Pyle's um, interpretation of grand trines, which is relatively new to me. I've not read Synthesis and Counselling until relatively recently. And he feels that uh, analysis of grand trines should be based upon two principles. Firstly, self-sufficiency and self-containment. 
and then the separation from relationship because of that self-containment. I found that quite intriguing. So he talks about each grand trine in the given element as being a closed circuit of self-sufficiency. So in water, the self-sufficiency is emotional. In earth, it's practical. I don't need any help from anyone else. In fire, it's motivational. Don't tell me what to do. I know I'm right. <laughs> and in air, a closed circuit of social or intellectual self-sufficiency. So I thought, okay, let's have a look at some of these. So we've got a few more charts to get through. Anne Fanshaw, oh my goodness, the, 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 some of these women are just wonderful. She travelled in support of her husband. Um, she was born into um, a very well-to-do family. Her father was a customs commissioner, but he was soon down on his luck because he basically lent all his money to Charles I just before the early part of the English Civil War. Uh, age 19, she married uh, her sweetheart, uh, Richard Fanshaw, who promptly joined the Royalist Army and was travelling around. So Anne travelled on her own around England, and it was not necessarily a safe place to travel. The going was hard underfoot. There were footpaths. There were people who were prepared to you know, uh, kill you for, um, for, for what riches you might be carrying. And she goes pretty much alone may have had one servant with her to try to raise money for the royalist cause. Anyway, it was it was lost, so they ended up as political refugees. And here's a lovely story that tells us something about her metal. Um, they encountered a Barbary pirate ship in full sail when they were near Gibraltar. Now, Barbary pirates were heavily involved in the white slave trade. Um, which continued right the way through the 16th and 17th and indeed even the 18th centuries until the navy grew enough to um, pr protect uh, ships, uh, British ships. But they saw this ship and they thought, right, I'm downstairs, go into the cabin. Well, she was having none of it. She bribed the cabin boy so that she could dress in his clothes and join her husband on the the, the deck. Um, luckily, they weren't attacked, as it turned out, and um, they did return to England uh, at the restoration of the monarchy. And then her husband was sent abroad as an ambassador, Portugal and Spain. All the time that she was with her husband and was probably pregnant or nursing, bless her, she bore 15 children, of whom only five survived to adulthood. That's, that's quite a toll on one's body. Uh, but it was Richard who died first in 1666 and went back to the UK at that point and wrote a memoir of her husband. And also she had a recipe book. Or it was actually a receipt book where she kept costs, you know, where the money was going, income, expenditure and so on. But this receipt book also included some recipes for icy cream, the first written recipe for ice cream. She also included hot chocolate and various um, cures that she felt for different diseases. So let's have a little look at her chart while well, you've had it in front of you for a while now. We've got this grand trine in earth. We've, we've got uh, so practical self-sufficiency. We've got a Capricorn moon, sorry, Capricorn Mars, something quite stalwart about that, good soldier there, um, a certain amount of independence and grit, something quite stoical about that, making a, a, a trine to her um, Venus trine, uh, Venus conjunct Pluto here, and to Jupiter, which happens to be on the nodal axis. And if you take into account Chiron as well, we, we've got a kite here. I, I think that nodal axis was really interesting. Um, she was born into riches, she loved the person that she married, but um, she was being pulled towards having to be practical and pragmatic. Okay, so wonderful story about her. Someone who went back um, quite far, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, Montague also followed her husband a, a, abroad. He was appointed as ambassador to the Ottoman Empire and she accompanied him. And while he was doing his ambassadorial duties, she lived with the Ottoman women and 
uh, made a lot of um, notes and diary entries and letters home about uh, her experience as a woman in Ottoman Constantinople, now Istanbul, of course. Um, she, she had a number of, of children and died relatively young, uh, having returned to London. Um, and she's another of these with um, a grand trine. This time it's a grand trine in water. So tile, uh, uh, sorry, Noel Tile would say uh, emotional self-sufficiency. Um, she's um, quite able to hold her own and uh, get on with her life independently of her husband who was doing all the ambassadorial things. Um, and again, uh, uh, possibly kites with, with Mercury there. Uh, sun in Taurus, degrounded. I'm going to go through these reasonably swiftly. It is light touch because I just want you to see a relatively large number of charts. Hester Stanhope, her, the person she was very fond of, so Robert, I forget the name, died at uh, Corinna, I think, and uh, she was pretty devastated by that. And she decided that she would set out on the road um, to distract herself, really. So escaping the grief of a lost love. And here we've got a grand trine in air. We've got um, Venus on the south node making this trine to air, air trine to Saturn and to um, the other societal planet, Jupiter. Um, what about Uranus? Is that making any... It's making a wide square to, um, to Mercury there. But um, intellectual self-sufficiency, according to Noel Tile. One of the most remarkable things about Lady Hester Stanhope is that um, she didn't necessarily make use of those expatriates um, who um, were in the places that she, she visited. She actually travelled with Bedouin escorts and um, there is one particular occasion uh, where she was so pleased with herself and um, she travelled with these Bedouin uh, tribesmen and there was this amazing occasion when there was she entered Palmyra, which is the, the seat of uh, an ancient queen, Zenobia, uh, around about 300, I can't remember if BC or AD, but anyway, um, this desert, desert place. And she was the first woman to go there and was crowned with flowers and things. And, and you can just look at that quotation, you can tell how gleeful she was to have, to have done that. Still pretty young. I have had a look at what were the actual transits that were happening um, <coughs> that day. Um, the date is taken from um, a, a journal, uh, an academic journal. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I've put a couple of things there. Um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, she's coming up to a nodal return. Uh, Neptune and Uranus are making some interesting aspects, but um, if you wish to go into this later on the recording, feel free to stop and have a good look for yourself. Very interesting. Okay, I said there were many different reasons for um, travelling. Alexandra David Neal, one of the few people for whom we have a, a timed chart, interesting that she was born on the continent. The continent seemed to be much better than the UK for keeping account of birth times than the UK is. Um, very interesting woman. She was the first Western woman to enter Lhasa, Tibet, and she was a prolific writer. And she had an incredibly interesting life. And her chart is quite complex, and in a minute I'm going to take the outer planets off, but have a look. This is a timed chart, so we know the house overlay. Have a look at that. We've got Uranus right on the MC. It, the most sort of outstanding thing about her is that she was a bit of a revolutionary. 
Uh, it's also making a number of aspects to different uh, points of the chart, including um, personal planets. Um, her father was an anarchist, and it, so was she. Um, she needed to make her own way in life to earn her own money, and she trained as an opera singer. So she went abroad, and she was an opera singer in Hanoi, then in Athens, then in Tunis. She became artistic director of the Tunis Casino. Very much an individualist, boundary breaking. Nobody was going to tell her what to do. And she decided to become a Buddhist aged 21. Okay, very unusual woman. As I said, I simplified this chart. I just took off the outer planets, but don't forget we do have Uranus right up there on the MC. I wanted to show, I wanted to show the kite. I wanted to show the grand trine, a fire grand trine in this case, someone who really feels that they know what it is they want to do and nobody's gonna stop them from doing what they want to do. We've got Mars in Leo, we've got Jupiter in Aries, we've got Saturn in uh, Sagittarius, and I'm making a kite, and this is a time chart, to her moon in Aquarius. So this very individualistic moon, um, and also we've actually got South Node in Aquarius as well. Um, she ruffled a few feathers when she was there, uh, she made a number of different forays um, to learn about Buddhism, to, try, to, to, to study it and to practice it. She spent a whole winter living in a, as a hermit in a cave and um, she was recognised as, as a holy woman, actually. Um, but the British authorities did not like her living in Sikkim and they ordered her out of the area. And she thought, right, OK, I'm going to Lhasa. What, listen to this, what right have they to erect barriers around a country that is not even lawfully theirs? So she set off for Peking uh, in order eventually to go to Lhasa, huge long trek, and she was eventually the first European woman to get there. She, she did what she set out to do. I've made comments about those aspects before, so, ah, okay. So, so moving on, I'm going to treat Gertrude Bell very briefly. Interesting woman. Um, okay, her father said she couldn't marry the person she wanted to, uh, but she was a great student and she really immersed herself in uh, studying uh, Arabic languages and Arabic ways. And she had a lifetime of traveling there. Um, she uh, did a, a, a lot, of, was responsible for a lot of digs. She's not as well known as T.E. Lawrence, but actually she helped Lawrence of Arabia when he first came. She, she was at least as experienced as, as he was. Uh, and here she is in all her, her, all her finery dressed up. And that's actually, that actually is Winston Churchill there. Um, but I, I'll be brief here because the trine is to Chiron. Um, uh, but we do have uh, Uranus, uh, again, making some interesting aspects there. Okay, I'm not going to spend long on Isabel Eberhardt, even though we do have a Times chart. Um, she converted to Islam and she took to, when she was traveling in Arabia, she took to wearing male dress. She felt that this would help her to find her way around safely. She was probably right, actually, traveling in a Muslim country. And um, the, the, her Muslim hosts essentially sort of turned a blind eye and just accepted her as an honorary male. Uh, but she uh, ruffled a few feathers. And um, yes, we've, we've got a grand trine here in fire, Mars, Uranus and, and Chiron again. Um, and Uranus is making a number of, a number of aspects. This is a timed chart. So 22 degrees, 25, um, th those are two out outer planets there, but oh, 22 degrees, look at, look at how close that trine is to her Mars in Sagittarius. Um, Noel Tile says, in every way, the fire trine is a do it, do your own thing, stamp of self-approval, and that's exactly, she, she followed her star. Okay, the last person I'm going to talk about tonight is Freya Stark interesting woman uh, born rather later than many on the list that i was looking at 
uh, British father, Italian mother. Uh, her interest in the Orient was piqued when, <coughs> excuse me, she uh, read A Thousand and One Nights very early on. Um, she was a linguist, fluent in French. She taught herself Latin, very clever. Age 30, she went to university and studied Arabic and other Persian languages. And what really pushed her to, so that's her second return again, a bit after, what really pushed her to do that is that her sister died um, having a miscarriage. And she said her sister Vera was not able to live life on her own terms. Freya was determined to do that. So the year after her sister died, off she went. She set off for Beirut. She was a very adventurous traveller, went to all sorts of different countries. I, I mean, <laughs> 1968, uh, age 75, she went to Afghanistan. She was an explorer, a photographer, a writer. She made maps. She did marry, but um, uh, the marriage was unusual. Um, he was actually gay, bless him, and um, they separated and had no children. So looking at her chart, um, Sun and Mercury in, in Aquarius there, independent, rebellious. We've got an air grand trine, intellectual and social uh, self-sufficiency. And I've got a couple of quotes that I think absolutely touch on that. Um, she's got quite a bit of fire. Uh, Mercury, her Mercury is in an air sign. There we are. And um, Uranus squares to the sun, maybe to the moon. Untimed chart, can't be sure. Have a look at this, talking about intellectual and social self-sufficiency. Rules that a good traveller should observe. To know how to use stupid men and inadequate tools with equanimity. To be able to disassociate, dissociate oneself from one's bodily sensations, I feel that's the Aquarius speaking there. And to be as calmly good-tempered at the end of the day as at the beginning. So although she kept some of these ideas, although certainly to herself while she was on her travels, um, she confided that she was not particularly impressed by quite a lot of the people that she met. And she is another woman who really wanted to travel because she wanted to travel for the sheer joy of it. I know in my heart of hearts that it's a most excellent reason to do things merely because one likes the doing of them. However, I would advise all those who wish to see unwrinkled brows at passport offices to start out ready labeled as entomologists, anthropologists or whatever other orgy they think suitable and propitious. Wonderful. Okay, so <coughs> uh, in conclusion, all of these women led remarkable lives and there were so many more I could also have included. It is just a wonderful journey to have gone on and find out. They all lived adventurously. Some managed to do so by at the same time actually occupying a more acceptable role as wife, daughter of a, a traveler, finding an ology. Uh, a number postponed their freedom until family obligations level uh, lesson. That was true of many of them. Others decided they were not going to conform to familial or societal expectations. That was it, they were off. And they found the courage to be completely and unapologetically themselves. Uh, the astrological correlates, not as straightforward as I had originally wondered about. Uh, there are no sun signs, and indeed really no other moon signs or personal planets that preclude people from living an adventurous life. We have choice. We have agency. But I think there is a growing picture that maybe aspects from Uranus to personal planets do seem to be supportive for someone who is determined to blaze their own trail. That's a very Uranian thing to do. Grand trines also seem to be supportive because they have this self-sufficiency in a particular area which helps people. So 
<clears throat> Above all, though, my main conclusion is that it is the individual charts that matter. Every single one of these women was unique. Their reasons for going were unique. And sometimes the reasons they offered were not necessarily the reasons that they felt in themselves. And I found myself wondering, as I began to analyze all of this, I, I think I'd started off with the idea that here we have a group of people who have, have burst open, uh, they're departing from their sexually defined roles. I wonder, actually, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. I think they're defining, some of them are departing from the roles assigned to them by culture. But actually, I think what many of them are doing, these trailblazing women, is they're showing that they were, in, as individuals, remarkable people who were brave enough to be themselves and able to gather together what they needed to follow their heart's longing. And I personally find that quite inspiring. <laughs>